what if we teach people how to go from that narrow focus to broadening their focus and opening their focus and focusing on nothing material or physical? When you teach purple people how to create heart coherence and self-regulate, then it makes sense then with a coherent brain they can hold the image of their future. Mm -hmm. They can actually then rehearse who they're going to be. They can bring up the emotions of their future. Now here's the cool part. Awesome. If they can feel their gratitude before their healing, their healing begins. If they feel their abundance or their worthiness before they have their wealth, it will start generating abundance. If they start being in love with themselves and being in love with life, they'll create an equal. That's the law. If they're in awe of life or in awe of the moment, they're going to have a mystical experience. If they're empowered, they're going to start stepping towards their success. success. Mm -hmm. So then when we wait for the outer world to change our internal state, that's a conditioning process because some people will live in lack and separation their entire life because right. they're not creating anything. Mm -hmm. When this happens, then I'll feel happy. That's the illusion of three-dimensional reality. That's cause and effect, but feeling the emotion ahead of the experience is causing an effect. So the heart, when it's coherent, tends to produce an external magnetic field that's up to three meters wide. Now you've got a Wi-Fi signal. Now when you have a coherent brain, the brain could actually lay the information on that signal. And the thought of your wealth or your health can be carried on the frequency of that heart emotion. Emotions are the end product of an experience, right? Uh, epigenetics says that it's the environment that signals the gene. gene. If the environment signals the gene and the end product of an experience in the environment is an emotion, that person's signaling genes ahead of the environment. Mm -hmm. And now they're biologically believing, behaving, and actually becoming that person. Mm -hmm. So if the person sustains that state and, state and we look at novice meditators that come for a week and 90% of them and, and the metabolites, not just a few, the majority of the metabolites in novice meditators suggest that their body's in a different life. And when you're in fear or you're in survival and your heart rate increases and your respiratory rate increases, your brain waves go up into this aroused state, right? And people spend 70% of their life there. anticipating the worst case scenario that's going to happen in their life and prepare for the worst. Chronic stress does what? It causes us to hold our breath. All right. So we found, you know, in our research and working with the HeartMath Institute and also some of the stuff we've been doing, that if you slow your breathing down, you slow your brain waves down. And if you teach your body to move out of survival, there's only one other thing it wants to do. It wants to create, right? Mm -hmm. So now just imagine a big drum. And now you're so contracted that you can't hit that drum. And as you learn and teach a person how to convert from that fight or flight nervous system to the nervous system of relaxation, the heart actually starts to bloom. And when you place your attention on your heart, we have the data. I can say this emphatically, that when that heart starts to beat in rhythm, it starts to inform the brain that it's time to create. Like taking a big sheet and going like this, a wave of energy goes right to the brain. The brain goes right in the alpha and says, it's safe now to create. Examine other possibilities. You're out of survival, right? right. So then as you hit that drum repeatedly, there's a wave of sound that's produced. And the more coherent it is, the more it can carry information. When we're in stress, we're trying to control, we're trying to predict, we're trying to organize our life because the, that unknown is uh, well, something can go wrong. It's unpredictable. So we shift our attention to one person, to another meeting, to another place we have to go, another time, another thing we have to do. And every single one of those elements has a neurological network in our brain because you've experienced your wife, you've experienced your coworker, you experience your, you know, your pain in your back, your cell phone, whatever. You have a relationship with everything physical or material. And it's mapped neurologically in the brain. In fact, the neocortex is really a record of the past, right? So the arousal of those stress hormones causes us to shift our attention to all of these different elements and we activate those circuits. And like a lightning storm in the clouds, the brain starts firing very incoherently. And when the brain is incoherent, we're incoherent. Mm -hmm. And when the brain isn't working right, we're not working right. Okay. At the same exact time, you're sitting in traffic. You can't really run. There's nowhere to run. You can't really fight. There's no one to fight. And, uh, you know, you can't really hide. And so the arousal of this primitive nervous system causes the heart, its rate to increase and a respiratory rate to increase mm -hmm. because that was the mechanism of survival if you're being chased by T-Rex you better uh, increase your heart rate and your respiratory rate. So now the heart rate and the respiratory rate are increasing, but you're not running, fighting, and hiding. There's a physiological change in your body for emergency. Yeah. 
and you're taking all this vital energy that you would use for growth and repair for long-term building projects and you're tapping all the body's resources and you're turning it and converting it into chemistry, right? Mm -hmm. So now the heart is racing, mm -hmm. but you're not using that energy. So it's pumping against a closed system and it causes the heart to start firing very incoherently and that's when you stop trusting that's when you stop loving that's when you stop communing that's when you stop cooperating uh, that's when you stop really creating or thinking about possibilities not a time to learn not a time to go within and so people spend the majority of their time living in the state and in that aroused state those chemicals heighten our senses and we narrow our focus on the material world because that's where the danger is. If something's behind the big rock and you hear it moving and it's dark at night mm -hmm. and you're walking, you're going to freeze mm -hmm. and you're going to narrow your focus and the arousal is going to heighten your senses. Mm -hmm. And that kind of narrow focus becomes habituated when people live mm -hmm. in constant stress and broadening their focus. Those different compartments of the brain that were firing out of order incoherently started to synchronize. Got it. Now what sinks in the brain, links in the brain. And all of a sudden the person starts to feel more like themselves. There's an integration. So we started noticing these elegant states where the, there was global coherence. In other words, we were measuring many compartments of the brain simultaneously. And when waves are working in order, when they're working in coherence, then the whole entire brain is working like a symphony. And you start feeling whole and you start feeling clear and you can think, you, you're coherent, you can have a vision or an intention of the future. So when we were doing these studies, we, we noticed that if we could teach people how to dial down mm -hmm. their thinking neocortex, their analytical mind, and by sensing space, if you're sensing you're not thinking or analyzing, you're sensing and you start slowing your brain waves from that high beta brainwave state when you're in survival into these lower beta brainwave states and ultimately into yeah. alpha. Okay. Alpha. Now okay. alpha is the creative state. Alpha is the imaginary state. That's when the voice in your head that's talking to you all the time, that default mode kind of shuts off and your brain starts to see in images and pictures. You start, you start imagining. It's an imaginary state. It's a creative state. So we use that state in the state of creation, but then we took it a little further. What if we could teach a person to slow their brain waves down even more into theta? And in theta, you're in a hypnotic state. And the hypnotic states cause you to be very suggestible to information. People wake up in the morning and they, they think about their problems. And those problems are memories that are etched in their brain that are connected to certain people and objects at certain times and places. The moment they wake up in the morning and they start thinking of their problems or thinking in the past. Okay, now every one of those problems has an emotion associated with it. So when they feel unhappy, when they feel bitter, when they feel fearful, now their body's in the past. Mm -hmm. Thoughts are the language of the brain, feelings are the language of the body. Thought and a feeling, image and emotion, stimulus and response, you're conditioning the body to be the mind of that emotion subconsciously. Now the body is believing it's living in the same past experience 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Why? Because the body's so objective, it doesn't know the difference between the real life experience that's creating that emotion and the emotion that person is creating it's by thought so alone. It's so important, the body doesn't know the difference. And so what, what the environment signals the gene, yep. that's epigenetics. The end product from an experience in the environment is an emotion. The person's signaling the same genes in the same way, and genes make proteins, and proteins are responsible for the structure and function of your body, and the expression of proteins is the expression of life. And now the person is actually headed for a genetic destiny. And when people labor for the present moment, and they take their attention off of their body, off of all the people in their life, all of the objects they own, their cell phone, their computer, their car, their house. They're no longer identifying with where they're sitting, where they need to be, where they live, where they've lived in the past, where they need to go. And they're not thinking about the f predictable future of the familiar past. They're dissociating from everything physical and material, everything known. That is the exact moment we call getting beyond yourself. The moment we inhibit that thought or the moment we become conscious of it and we no longer accept it, there's a biological craving that takes place in the body because the body has been conditioned to be the mind. So the body starts influencing the mind to think more corresponding thoughts equal to that feeling. So here comes the assault. Then you're not only unworthy, you're, you're everything else that goes along with that feeling. And this is where uh, people have to make up their mind if they truly want to change. Because if you decide to confront that thought and make a different choice, get ready because you're going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to feel unfamiliar. And it's gonna, there's going to be some uncertainty because you're stepping out of familiar territory. 
Uh, you're stepping out of the known and you're stepping into the unknown. Now, this is really when you leave the bleachers and you get on the playing field because the brain immediately looks around in its environment to see if anything's changing because you're changing and you see that nothing in your world is changing because you actually haven't fully changed yet. So the moment we look for evidence in our life and we don't see it, Sooner or later, most people accept that thought, which leads to the same choice, which creates the same behavior, which creates the same experience that produces the same feeling. And then they say, oh, this feels right to me. No, that feels familiar because you've just returned back to the known self. I think that when people truly want to make up their mind to change and they become so conscious of those unconscious thoughts, they would never go unconscious to them again. Mm. That's the moment the body is being reconditioned to a new mind. If you inhibit that choice, that leads to that habit or that behavior. A habit is when you've done something so many times, the body knows how to do it better than the brain. Now you're stopping the body from being on its automation, on autopilot. And if the body's craving the feeling of unworthiness and you're stopping the body from feeling that way, and you're aware in your life how you speak, you're aware in your life how you're feeling, and you're checking in, you're saying, do I really want to feel this way? This is that river of change where you're going from the old self to the new self. So it makes sense then. If those principles in biology work in that way, they could actually work in our favor. So if you said, okay, I'm going to sit down for a few minutes. I'm going to become so conscious of my unconscious self, my unconscious personality, that a victory today would not be going unconscious to those thoughts behaviors and emotions. Okay. Let me get so familiar with them that I don't go unconscious. Okay. I got that down. I now, what, that. what thoughts do I want to fire and wire in my brain? And if a belief is a thought that you keep thinking over and over again with intention and with attention, you'll switch on that prefrontal cortex and assign meaning to the act and start installing new circuits in your brain. If you keep doing it over and over again, it becomes more hardwired. It becomes more automatic. And now you're installing a new belief that you are worthy of love, you are worthy of abundance, you are worthy to heal, whatever that is. That's the thought you do want to believe in. And when it matters the most is when it's the hardest. Because if you don't have the circuitry in place, you'll default back to the old program.